Let's begin with prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We were in chapter 7. So on your outline, on your chart, we're at the bottom of the the column of the seven seals. But we haven't gotten to the seventh seal yet. We're at that interlude in chapter 7. The beginning part that we covered was the 144,000, the church on earth. Remember, because there were those, these angels, four angels holding back the winds, holding back the destruction to come on the earth, and said they're going to hold back until all those who had been sealed were sealed, and that was the 144,000. So th- those who would, the, the church, his elect, would be marked and would be safe when the destruction comes, right? And so that's where you have the, the, if the church has it, it's on earth and it's not going to be destroyed. And then in verse 9, it turns from those sealed on earth, protected from the winds and the destruction, then it turns again to the throne. So it's kind of doing this back and forth between looking at what's going on on earth and how God's people are protected, even though there's great catastrophe coming at them, and then looking back in heaven and saying, oh, look, they're all right. Things are going to be okay. Uh, so in chapter or verse 9, I can't remember if we had started this section or not when we were starting. <laughs> After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, all, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And we, so we've seen all of this before. That fourfold from every nation, tribe, peoples, and languages. That's in verse 9. Uh, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's the same throne and the Lamb we saw in chapter 4. Uh, clothed in white robes. That, that showed up a number of times already. You had that in the letters. You had Jesus is in a white robe in chapter 1. And then there in, in, uh, in the letters he says, you haven't stained your your robes, the, the, the righteousness of Christ. And, and that's going to explain that next in this later chapter, or just in a little bit here. Who are these in white robes? Palm branches in their hands. Palms were a sign of victory. Conquerors had the palm branches. Um, palm branches in their hands. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. In verse 11, And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. See, up until this point, it's kind of been the same. It's all part of the same vision. You've got these different parts of it, you know, the seals and, and such, but it's generally the, the same thing. The, the lamb at the center with the living creatures and the elders fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Did you catch that again? How many are there? Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Seven again. Sim- very similar to the one in uh, chapter 5. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Very similar. Not identical, but similar in both of them. Seven. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Okay? Verse 13. I think that we had had at least maybe gotten that far. Verse 13. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And where have they come? And from where have they come? Uh, We don't know which one of the elders. There's 24 elders. Doesn't say who this is. Um, I said to him, Sir, you know. As if, it's like, you tell me. You're, you're like, a, like a teacher who's asking, these, you know, asks questions. Um, you're the teacher, you tell me. Uh, and he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. 
They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, so when we come to that, that line, these are those, the, the ones coming out of the great tribulation. This is one of those verses that the, the millennialists, those teaching the thousand year and, the, and especially the rapture, they'll find that in this verse. These are those, uh, um, and that would fit better actually with it. So it's an unfortunate translation that they, in the NIV, if you notice that, it, it reads differently. If you're looking at the NIV, I think it says, these are they who have come, who have come out. Um, and I read, these are those coming out. Uh, so the, the, it's a participle in Greek. The tense is a present tense. Um, and that fits, that fits better, uh, better translation. Uh, because those who believe in the, the rapture, they say, these are they who have come out. They've been raptured. Uh, and they'll use that verse. Uh, they've, they've been raptured out of the, the great tribulation. And the great tribulation in that system is a seven-year period of great of the great tribulation, and sometimes they'll, well, sometimes some of them will say it's three and a half years, and the, the tribulation is a seven-year, and the great tribulation is just the last three and a half. That's not in the text anywhere, but but they'll use this verse in in part, um, and the the tense in the NIV doesn't it kind of helps them out a little bit, but the tense is just a present tense. These are those coming out. Um, because they are still coming out, uh, what is the tribulation that they've come out of? And that will be explained later on because it's going to go and say, um, there they shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more, sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. What have they come out of? Life. These are they who have come out, who are coming out of the great tribulation. Um, they, they've, the great, what is the tribulation? It's life. It's this present life that they that they live but they're out of it now and so now they don't have back there the, in the tribulation there was crying and there was mourning and there the sun beat upon them all of that stuff and now they're done with it see that's all it's saying uh, so about that the rapture i don't you here's a, a chart i think that's kind of well actually i don't know how helpful it is because it's very um there's a lot of stuff going on but just to see there's a lot of weird stuff that is uh, drawn from and trying to figure out. It's, it's, it's viewing all of this in that, that uh, what do we call that, futuristic way. Um, you've got different millennialism. So millennial refers to the thousand years. And so then they, there's this thousand year period in there. It's a literal thousand years. Um, and when does Jesus come? Does he come before the millennium? Are they pre-millennialists? Or are they post-millennial? Does Jesus come after the millennium? That's a post millennium. But then you have the rapture, and you have pre trib, mid trib, and post trib, pre millennialists, um, on whether or not this tribulation comes after the, tri after the rapture or before the rapture, and that this maybe is the rapture. Here's another one, kind of similar, because this doesn't even get into the details um, of these. You've got. So the pre-trib millennium, pre-millennials um, will have the, a rapture where Jesus is going to take out the real believers. And then you're going to have a tribulation where all the, there are no real believers anymore. Um, and then Jesus is going to come back with his church at the end of the tribulation. And then they're going to have the millennium, the thousand year reign on, on earth. But then there's others who say, no, there's going to be, a, a tribulation is going to start halfway through. Then the rapture is going to come, and then the rest, and then, so they just shorten that up. And it's usually at three and a half years. Um, or you've got post-trib premillennialists, where gee, the rapture comes, and this kind of happens all at once. And that there's a tribulation that comes before this, and then comes, and then the millennium. Um, and post-millennium, just kind of, there's a millennium, and then Jesus comes at the very end of it. Um, but also a thousand year. So none of, none of this is true. <laughs> this is all trying to trying to figure this stuff out, mm -hmm. assuming that Jesus is going to come and he's going to set up right hand. There's the, this idea of a, of a rapture 
uh, where he takes the believers and leaves the unbelievers on earth. That's, that's not, it's not there. But so when they read this, then they say, ah, see, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation. Uh, they were raptured out, away from the tribulation. They were either, they escaped it by Jesus rapturing them out beforehand or during it. Right? That's the idea. But so our, our teaching on this, um, we, would, we would call this. We call amillennialism, which simply means there is no millennium. Um, and then this listed as a symbolic millennium, which is what we would say. The thousand years is a symbolic number. And what does it describe? It describes the whole New Testament age. It's ever since Jesus went away and said, I'm coming back until he comes back. That is the millennium. Yes, just like he said, you don't know the day or the hour. I'm not telling you, <laughs> um, and, 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 but be ready. And in this end, then he describes this period. And how does that go? Well, that's kind of what a lot of this book is about and all of Jesus' uh, telling of the signs of the end. Yeah, that's what he's describing. He's describing life for us while we wait for him. Yeah. So these are those coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So that's how their robes got white. Got washed in the blood of the Lamb. Um, which is taught over and over again. The, the redeeming, cleansing nature of the blood of Jesus that covers us by his, by his righteousness. And they are, they are robed. They're white. Which is a beautiful picture then. I mean, from, from the very beginning, we, we associate the, the, the white garment, you know, for, for uh, centuries Christians have, have, uh, have clothed the baptized in, in white robes. Yeah? In the early church, they didn't put you in a white robe until after your baptism. Now we bring the baby in, yeah, in white, dressed in white, but the, we get the picture, I think, still. If, if someone wanted to bring, bring and have the baby baptized without clothes on, I wouldn't fight him on it. Um, maybe get a swimming diaper or something. Um, and our, our font isn't big enough to get them all the way in anyway, so they could leave a diaper on. Um, but there are some uh, churches that still baptize grown They baptize who? Adults. Adults. Oh, yeah, and we would too if they're not baptized. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's some who don't baptize. They want to wait till they Yeah. Yeah. You know, they have a different idea of what baptism is. Yeah. Which then, yeah. Um, and the early church adult, baptized a lot of adults, and that's actually where it starts because they were converts to Christianity, right? And, the, and, uh, and they too were given, they, they were baptized without clothes on too in the early church. I, mean, I think we might have talked about that when we were going through church history. In the, yeah. Big baptismal buildings. Yeah, in a baptistry. Yeah. yeah. And we see that we have archaeology. Well, that's we, what's one way we identify Christian churches is by the baptistry. Is that they had a place for baptisms. Um, yeah. Sometimes separate building or a separate room or something. Yeah. Why would um, they baptize the naked? Uh, as a as a symbol of entire entire washing. I mean, for the same reason that everyone you generally take baths and showers without clothes on, so it's a bath. So that was, um, and then like one of the the roles of a sponsor then was to hold the kind of hold a sheet up, and then would help put clothe them afterwards. Yeah, we have descriptions very early in the church of of, of those baptisms. Yeah. All right. Uh, they have washed their robes. Uh, oh, and, and so we start at baptism, but we, we continue that thread all the way into the, the, the practice of, of a, at our funerals and, and clothing the, the deceased, the body, in white again um, as a reminder of that very same thing. Um, you know, at, at, the, at the funeral, they are wearing white robes uh, and... Even, even, even brighter than a baptismal gown, even brighter than a funeral pall, uh, but clothed in Christ and washed in His blood. 
beautiful. This is, and it gets even better. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And you've heard that, those verses. Um, I think it's, I should know this already, but I think that's our, that's our um, lesson next Sunday for all saints. Uh, we'll read that as a, it's the epistle or Old Testament reading. And uh, that, that it does, it's not pulled out of nowhere. Um, parts of it come from Isaiah 49, verse 10. I'll read that for you. If I can find it quick. Isaiah 49, verse 10. They shall not hunger or thirst, nor neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. You can hear it in there, right? That's from Isaiah. Uh, so it's just kind of expanded on that. Uh, Becker points out in his lectures, numbering the, the kind of statements that are here. It says, they are before the throne of God. One, serve him day and night in his temple. Two, he who sits on the throne will shelter them from his presence. Three, neither hunger no more. Four, thirst any more. Five, sun shall not scor- strike them. Six, nor any scorching heat. Seven, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Eight, and he will guide them to springs of living water. Nine, and ten, he, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Counting ten, like the completeness of the joy of heaven. Again, not it doesn't say ten things. It doesn't say the number ten, but just list them that way. Um, and just yeah, drawing. You've got the lamb at the midst of the the throne. Then then it turns that. And here you see that now the lamb becomes the shepherd, which he already had in Isaiah, like Isaiah fifty three. You know, we like sheep have gone astray, so is under the shepherd. But then he. Um, like a lamb before her shears is silent, so he does not open his mouth. That we are the sheep, or is he the sheep? Well, he's the one who goes in place of the sheep in order to be the shepherd. And this, this wonderful, I mean, that, that has ideas. Um, I mean, like I said, it was in Psalm, Isaiah 49, but also the 23rd Psalm, to lead them to springs of living water. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I, mean, I, I don't know about you, but like, are there more beautiful descriptions? And notice that it's mainly a, a, a negative one. It's mainly a negative one in the sense that it's describing what's not there. And, and yet we hear that and we think, oh, that's so nice. And it's just describing what, it, what is not there. Um, Neither hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. It's just driving things that are, that are absent, and that's a relief to us. But then the positive things the, of serving him day and night in his temple, being before the throne of God, like these 24 elders, four living creatures, angels around the throne, and now this multitude that no one can count, dressed in white robes there. <clears throat> Was John the last of the disciples then, when he wrote this? Yeah, that we know of him. Yeah, the only one that wasn't executed that we, yeah. Yeah, that we know of. Um, what tremendous comfort then for those who are suffering persecutions, afraid, feeling uh, you know, alone. You've got, he said that even there he will be the shepherd. Living water, Jesus talks about the living water that, that if you drink of this, you'll never be thirsty again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you know, that the question before, at the end, we were in the middle of the seven seals. Not in the middle, but at the end, right? We had gotten six seals. Well, here, let me show you. We had six seals. Uh, the, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. Then you've got the fifth seal, 
being the souls under the altar, crying out, so there's pers- they're being persecuted, and, and they're awaiting how long? Well, there's more to come. And then the sixth seal basically describes those, those signs at the very end, the earthquakes, and, and, and then the end shall come, and then it says, and then it, this interlude of chapter 7 just kind of stuck in there. Because at the end of it, it, it asked, you know, uh, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And then it, it says, well, <laughs> well, here's some who can stand, 144,000 who have been sealed and are protected from this calamity. They are going to experience, it's not like these things, the, the, the signs of the end, these don't, it's not that they don't affect us Christians, they do, right? Earthquakes, they hit us too, and death and famine and all of this stuff, and war. We're all subject to all of it, and especially persecution. Um, but, you know, oh, but when this comes, who can stand? <laughs> 44,000 or a number that no one can count, in fact, standing before the throne. There would be all right. So now we're going to go back and get the seventh seal. And that seventh seal, as you can see on your, on your outline, it is sort of a, a, a launching point for the next set. It would be the seven trumpets. Okay? Um, but I think that might be helpful in figuring out what these seven trumpets and what this seventh seal is all about by remembering that this... This was coming. Just to notice and remember, when we had gone through this, we had looked at Matthew 24 and seen the things that Jesus said would precede his return, right? And we listed them there, and then we saw a number of these things. Remember we had said, the white horse, <clears throat> some people will say that those are false Christs. And that could be. Um, but just following what Becker suggests, he suggests that that is, that the white horse is Christ, and that indicates the spread of the gospel. You've got these things, then, that aren't really mentioned here uh, in, in chapter 6. <clears throat> Not a specific mention to false Christs or false prophets, which are very similar. And then apostasy and the love of most growing cold, right? Uh, and he's going to suggest that that's indicated, then, by the seventh seal. And that the sum of those things is, is basically uh, false doctrine and ungodly living. That, that, that is amongst us in the, in the world. All right, so let's turn to chapter 8. Oh, let me back up. Chapter 8. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And then I saw the seven angels who stand before the throne of God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Silence in heaven for about a half an hour. I... Um, That's got to be translated because John would have never thought he'd talk to him. Well, so silence in heaven. If, um, if I if I just pause. You know what I, you know what I noticed that all of a sudden I could see eyes starting popping up when I just stopped talking. And it was about, do you know how long, how long it is when we, and when we have silence, brief, uh, med, silence for meditation? Do you know how long that is? How, how many? 15 seconds. 15? It's closer to seven. Yeah. It, it will always seem longer <laughs> when, when it's silence. Uh, silence is something like if... If I were to do that, if I were to 30 seconds in, in say, in, in a sermon, I, I, I'm always tempted to try it sometime. Um, and maybe sometime, I, you know, but it, just, just even just, a, just two seconds. Everyone will look up and say, what, did he lose his place? You know, is he, is something wrong? <laughs> uh, our first responders are like, do you need to step in? No. Um, right? And... and 30 minutes, half an hour. Uh, what, what's the point of that? Anticipation. Yeah, it, it, would, it would end up being very uncomfortable by the end of it, but what, what happens then? Um, whatever happens after that, whatever is said. So there's some, it's, 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 I don't know if it's just drama, but it... it, it um, it, it evokes that something important is coming. So silence, which is, that's amazing. Half an hour of silence. 
Not, and the word, I guess, um, the, the word in Greek is not just for like quiet. It's dead silence. Nothing. Uh, what kind of reminds me of or makes me think of is when, when the temple was built, the instructions for building the temple, <coughs> there were instructions that no, there were to be no sound at the building site. So if they were hammering or cutting, that was done off site. I mean, still, they could not have been silent there because you're moving stuff around and there's people moving around. Um, but what a, what a weird, I mean, you think of a construction site, and that's, you know, noisy as there's everything, right? Um, even pre-mechanical uh, stuff, right? Um, no, not to be, not to disturb even the, in the building site of the temple. But here, silence in heaven for half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stood before, the, uh, before God. Now, it doesn't tell us what these angels are, seven angels. Some people have said, well, these are the seven archangels. But the Bible doesn't ever list seven archangels. In fact, the, the word archangel in the Bible is only ever used in the singular. The archangel Michael is referred to, but there's never mention of archangels, actually. Um, we're never really... So it, that there could be, but we just don't. We don't have. Um, so who these seven angels are, we don't. We don't know. But there's seven, and we've seen that before. Um, they stand before the before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And so we've had. We've had the uh, censors before, uh, the censors of the angels, or the, it's the golden bowls of, full of incense, which are the prayers. So each of the four living creatures and the 24 elders uh, holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, saints there, it says. Here it says, um, he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the, before the <coughs> Lamb. Uh, so here, that described there, the prayers, the, the incense is the, is the prayers. Here is they're given with the, the, the incense is, is, as it's going up. Uh, what, what is the incense? Uh, well, the purpose for incense was, was the smell of it, right? was that it was a pleasing smell to God. Uh, and if these are our prayers, how do our prayers, I've mentioned this before, how do our prayers, how are our prayers acceptable to God? The prayers of sinners are not acceptable to God. We say in the catechism, um, uh, we, we pray that God would not reject our prayers because of our sin, before we daily sin much and surely deserve. We don't just, God should not listen to our prayers because of our sins. They are, they're a stench to him. But, the, but the, what is the incense then that makes our prayers acceptable to God? What is it that does make him want to hear us, desire to hear us? Um, what, by sin, it's a stench. But would be the merits of Christ. Uh, that makes our prayers acceptable to God. Uh, it's Jesus which I think I've mentioned before. I think it's a, it's a fascinating kind of thought of, uh, of incense being used as, as it's the smell of Jesus to God. That's what we're, we're trying to communicate. So like in the church, why the church has used, uh, the, the, what, what scents are often used, things like myrrh, frankincense, still those, those senses, scents of incense. What were those? One, they were the gifts that were given to the, to the, by the wise men. But there are also some of the spices that were packed into by Jesus' corpse. And I just just try to imagine um, when, when Jesus appears on Easter morning, having been resting. Now he doesn't smell like death, I suppose, right? He's 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 not dead, and he doesn't doesn't decay, so he doesn't. But if he had been, if unless he had showered in the meantime, now maybe he didn't. Maybe Jesus had. A naturally pleasant body odor 
but if he had been packed with, with frankincense and, or, or myrrh uh, for going on three days, um, that's kind of what he smells like too, perhaps. But um, So that's just kind of inter inter interesting thought as you kind of smell the smell. What is the, the, the point being that the, the work of Jesus is what makes our prayers acceptable. Him. He is the incense that makes a, our, our prayers acceptable to him. And so the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And remember what some of those prayers were? Um, now, I think that's talking about the prayers of the saints on earth. Remember we said when we talk about the saints in the Bible, generally we're talking about those on earth. But we, even, we did have the prayers of those in heaven under the altar. Remember? The martyrs under the altar, the souls. And what were they praying? How long, O Lord, until you avenge our, bro our blood? Right? What do you su so if they're praying that, what do you suppose the saints on earth are praying? Who are under persecution and suffering. I think they might be praying some of the same thing. Uh, or protect us from this... Impending disaster. Uh, all the things that, that God's people are, are coming before him with uh, on earth. And what is, what's the reaction to it? This is interesting. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. This, from, from this, then down upon the earth comes fire. Now the seven angels, now we got the seven trumpets. So they all have seven trumpets. Seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. Um, the first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up. And a third of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, likewise a third of the night. Okay, so now we've got four angels blowing four trumpets, and what, are they, what kind of things are happening? It's destructive things, right? Calamities of you know, fire. Mountain, a mountain burning with fire sounds like kind of like a, a volcano kind of thing going on. A, a meteor, star from heaven. It doesn't tell us, I mean, it tells us the name of the star. but So we're not given a lot of details in, in what these are. These aren't as obvious in this chapter as they are in chapter 6. And, we, and some of them, I say, well, that wasn't obvious in chapter 6 either. But that one, you could kind of tell. You've got the, the writers, and they're sent for a certain thing. And, and here, they're similar. Similar kind of destructive, terrifying sort of things. What does it remind you of from the Bible? What kind of calamities does this remind you of? Water being turned to blood. Okay, the outside of the Bible from history, you got destructive things like volcanoes. Um, plagues. The plagues in Egypt. Similar, it's not one for one, right? But you do have some of the same kind of things. You've got uh, hail, that was one of them too. The, uh, a lot of death and destruction. Um, but here, what, what's the extent of the destruction with this? It's not complete destruction, is it? How, the, it's a third, right? 
um, which is more than in uh, the during the the riders on the red on the horses. It says that they were given control over a fourth of things, and now they've got a, now these things are destroying a third. So that's getting so people like get you know, when they don't know their fractions, and they you know and you have there's someone selling a, a third of a of a pound hamburger. And they think that a quarter pounder is bigger because <laughs> McDonald's is very good at marketing. <laughs> you know, but like someone trying to sell a third pound burger that like, I don't want, I want a quarter pounder. Because <laughs> four is bigger than three, right? Like, um, so, it's, so it's a larger section, but it's limited, isn't it? It's still limited. Um, it's still wide, wide destruction. Now, what exactly are these other than very similar to the other things? This, though, comes as a result of this, the sensor being thrown down. And when you've got the thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning seem to be God's judgment um, uh, upon, upon the earth. Uh, what is this? Now, uh, Becker likes to talk about figuring out some of the parts of Revelation. It's kind of like doing a crossword puzzle. Where once you once you could figure out a clue going this way, that kind of kind of help you, and so uh, his his suggestion comes and, and his understanding comes as you get down further into it, into the fifth angel, in understanding what he thinks that these are kind of all in general sort of reference to, uh, but it could simply be like chapter six. And it's, it sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? And the Christians are living in this world, and there's destruction, and there's, there's stuff going on. Um, but let's, let's keep going to verse 13. It says, Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Whoa. whoa. Um, notice that. Um, an eagle flying overhead. You're going to have the same, very similar description in our First lesson today from Revelation 14. That's going to be our sermon text there. Um, there it's an angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim. Um, and, and if you were to read this in the King James, they, they don't have the word eagle. They have a, an angel. And, and likely that because in, in chapter 14 it says angel and eagles can't talk, well, Normally, eagles can't talk, but here we're in Revelation. Anything can talk. Um, so perhaps they had, they had cor- wanted to correct that, and so they put an angel here, but it's an eagle here. In chapter 14, it does have an angel. Fl- but it's the same thing. It flew directly overhead, it says. Uh, but it, the eagle is crying out with a loud voice, and it says, whoa, 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 three woes. How many trumpets are left? Well, we've had four. So three left, um, and uh, and so we got three woes, and it's gonna it's gonna come back to us. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Well, it sounds like we've had had, already had some woe going on, but we're gonna have more. It's gonna be gonna be worse. It says then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were, not, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Um, so also sounds really bad, right? Uh, what is it? First, you've got the star fallen who's given the key to the abyss, um, the bottomless pit. And then out comes the smoke. Um, but uh, notice then they've got then these locusts. And the locusts. And what are they told? Not to harm the grass or the tree or green plants. 
you, un- you, you're from, you know what locusts do, right? That's exactly what they eat, right? But these are told not to eat that. What are they eating then? <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of insect is this that's not doing what the insects normally do? Well, it's not a physical destruction. Not the normal destruction that these locusts do. And it's only going to affect those who don't have the seal of God on their forehead. The, the ones that have the seal of God are, the, are the, 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 the ones marked, the children of God. They're, they're safe from this. But this destructive force is going to go out, and it's like smoke coming out of the abyss, um, out of the depths of hell, that's going to even blot out the sun. So Becker suggests that this, and, and that's what's in your, um, in your study guide. It says an alternate view of these four disasters are symbols of false doctrine rather than natural disasters. That it's false doctrine. That comes like smoke out of, the, out of the depths of hell. That clouds out the sun. The sun is described, the, the light of God is shining. Um, and it blocks, it, it, it distorts it obfuscates, it, 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 it covers over the clearness of God's word. And it, and it only affects it. those who have the seal of God on their forehead, they're not harmed by that. Because they have the word of God. They have the truth. Um, but it's going to lead other, others astray. Um, what is the torment like? It describes the torment of these locusts. Their bite is like a scorpion. When it stings someone and they, 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 they don't die from it. But they'll wish they were. Their hope is lost. And and probably, perhaps the worst, the worst effect of false teaching is that it takes away hope. That it leads to despair. Um, The confidence of the gospel, if someone doesn't have that because they've been robbed it, because the certainty of their salvation and faith in Christ is, is, is gone. Um... I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting take. And what the, one of the reasons that he does it, like I said, remember those, there those gaps of those things that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24? The false Christs, the false prophets, a great apostasy, the love of, of most growing cold, um, ungodly living and false teaching. Uh, that, that doesn't get dealt with in those other seals and says, now, now here it is. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's a, it's a true thing that those are dangers that false doctrine is. And so I think one, one way to think about it, or one, a good question to ask, is which is more dangerous? If all of these things are simply physical calamities upon the earth, which is worse? Which is more deadly? Which is more dangerous? Fire and volcano, and locusts, and all of that stuff, or false teaching. We're tempted to think that it's all the physical stuff. But see, all the physical stuff can't hurt the elect. Um, Jesus says, it's also in Matthew 24, where he says um, that one of the reasons that the end hasn't come um, he, or he says that the, 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 the come, it will come, uh, false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. But that, you see, the elect can't actually be led astray. But, but he says if, if he didn't come when he comes, they would even be led astray. So they're, they're at risk, and then he comes so that they, they aren't, and they're, they're protected. They are saved. But this, this false teaching, uh, the false Christ and false prophets, says they would even, even threaten to, uh, to f- draw the elect away. Um, but which is more deadly? Um, like I said, uh, we're inclined by, by sort of nature to think that the, the, more, the more scary thing is that the, these locusts um, and the, I don't know, the volcanoes and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and plague and, whoa, pandemic. 
That's the worst thing. That's not the worst thing. (laughs) The thing that kills a third of the earth, that's not the worst thing. What is the worst thing? Is if God would, if his word would not be among us. If his word would be clouded. If we did not have the certainty of God in his word and in his Christ. Um, So I think that, that's, that's worth considering then. Um, and that, that is displayed here. And he's going to suggest that this, then, then you're going to have, so you've got to have this, this uh, description of the uh, symbolic effects of false teaching. And then, then you're going to have the, the true teaching is going to still be there. That's going to come, come later. If you want to think that all the, the trumpets then um, are simply uh, natural disasters. You, I, I won't yell at you for that. Uh, but I think uh, Becker's uh, direction on this is worth considering. Uh, one other a- aspect of that is this, the, the, the scorpions. Oh, that's coming up, the locusts, in verse 7. We haven't gotten there. Let's read. Verse 7. In appearance, the locusts were like horses preparing for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair like women's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions. And their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, he is called Apollyon. And both of those names mean destruction or destroyer. One in Hebrew and one in Greek. Um, and, and certainly the, the devil is, is the destroyer. Um, and what is his, how does he destroy? Um, I don't know. I'd have to think more. Like, what does it mean? That, that the, his power to hurt is in the tail. I don't know. Um, uh, it's just like... Like a scorpion, like that. But what's the? Is there more significance of that? Um, one thing that you see is this no, this kind of militaristic nature of this army of locusts. They have helmets. What does it say? Uh, like horses prepared for battle and have. Um, they're they're armed, and and that would sort of fit. You've never noticed the, the kind of the militaristic nature of false teaching. Yeah, um, it wants to conquer. And it wants to win uh, those for, for itself. Um, perhaps it, it has a sort of appearance, like even these crowns. You remember it talked about the, the believers having crowns of gold. They reign. These, these locusts have what looked like crowns of gold. Um, that's the crown is something that's given for victor. And they have something that looks like it. It's like they're, they're wearing Burger King crowns. Um, Pretending like they're the victors. Pretending that they're on the right side of history. And you've got to go along with them. Um, otherwise, you're going to be left behind. You're going to be run over. Um, and how do they look? I mean, this, this, this is this, this. I'm not going to put a picture of this up. Oh, this would give you nightmares. Uh, like this, this idea, the hair like women's hair, teeth like lion's teeth, breastplates, faces like human faces. Um, what, what do they look like? Um, what, I mean, they're, 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 this, they're this killing creature, right? But they have hair like women's hair. It's, it's, it's like they're, they're lions in women's wigs. Um, they're like sheep in wolf's clothing. Wolf's in sheep clothes, sheep's clothing. Sorry. Right? They, they, oh, they, they, they on the, kind of on the outside, they have some appearance of, of prettiness. But inside they are ferocious. You know, they've got the teeth like lions. Um, and false, false teaching certainly is that. False teaching comes as some appealing idea. Um, and yet is, 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 I would say, more destructive. False doctrine is more destructive than physical calamity. See, because physical calamity doesn't hurt your eternity. 
Not, auto, not, not automatically. But, but if he robs us of our salvation, that's, that's it. See? Um, so the, and so if nothing else that we get from this chapter is that that should be feared more than the worst that could happen. That the light of God's word should be blotted out from us. That would be the most horrific thing. Yeah? Can you imagine all those unbelievers on earth when all this is going on going, whoa, just kidding. I mean, I guess I believe now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like this, like the pictures of the, the people climbing up to the mountains when the flood comes. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you know, and these people who had laughed at Noah for building the ark. And now they're just <coughs> pushing each other to get to the top so that they can uh, continue breathing for a little longer until the flood waters come. Uh, so that's... That's the first wall. <laughs> Remember, we said, whoa, 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 three times. And he says, though, now verse 12, the first wall has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. <laughs> then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision. And those who rode them, they wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. By the smoke and fire, fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, or, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So now you start to see, you know, sometimes like reading through, you can't get the whole thing until you, you know, you go through the whole crossword puzzle and you're trying to, trying to fit stuff in. These, these are calls to repentance. And even these did not. A third of everyone's dead and they still will not give it up. Um, and and, and it, what it shows is the, the tenacity of unbelief and, and the stubbornness to hold on to it, and they will. Um, See, so those who hear the voice of Jesus <coughs> in their call to repentance will, will, will come to repentance. <coughs> They've been sealed. But no matter how many times he calls them to repent, they simply will not. There's not this thing where, well, you know, like you, you said, like, you know, what, what about these people who said, well, yeah, I was just joking, like, they, as if they didn't have opportunity, you know? So it's not like there are going to be every times, like, I wish I had another chance. I think by the end, they will have known that we had every chance possible, you know? It's like God saying to, to Cain, you know, like, uh, uh, to, yeah, to to Cain, like, where's your brother? Coming to Adam and Eve, where are you, Adam? Giving them opportunity. Who, you know, where are you? Did you eat from the tree? And just continuing calling to repentance over and over and over again. And even by the use of, by means of this, and they still do not. Um, so there's no, like, idea that so some people are just going to get stuck. Like they would have repented if someone had, had tried again. You know, Jesus says, neither will they listen even if someone rises from the dead. Um, yeah. But then, then we're going to have, we're gonna have um, comfort again. So it's good, it's like it said, it goes back and forth. You get this terrible picture of what's going on on earth and, and, and horrific ideas, but then but, but, but the, the truth is still being proclaimed. All the way through. The, 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 the light of God's word is not actually being dis- extinguished. As you see here in chapter 10, you'll see it again in chapter 14 in church. Um, 
which, with, with which we can rejoice. So that gets us to the end of, well, we're halfway through or partway through the, the seven trumpets. We've got, then that's going to shift into the, the seven visions, uh, well, then seven vials. They all kind of piggyback on each other. They, can, they don't like finish the one before they get the other one going. All right, shall we close with God's word is our great heritage?